So, yeah, page 15, we're, we're in the last third of a long set of notes that I gave you. It would have been two studies ago now, so this will be part three out of that. I have been breaking these up into smaller chunks for usage on the internet uh, for people that are following along in that way. This will be lesson 69. Uh, and this will be the last lesson before we take our break again for the summer. I uh, sat down this week and I made a, a running list of everything that I think we need to still discuss and uh, finish up with before we actually finish the class. But um, this is Lesson 69, and I checked this morning, there have been almost 20,000 hits on the uh, Grace History Project uh, blog site. That's people checking us out on the internet and so on. So, uh, I mean, the word is definitely getting out, at least to some degree, that we're doing this. Um, most people that are paying attention. Check, uh, page 15, when we left off last time, we had finished looking at, uh, we're in the middle of surveying the advancements in dispensational Pauline truth and understanding from 1870 to 1900. And there's one final uh, work that I want to look at, and that's a second one by Bullinger. Last time we were looking at uh, Bullinger's study on um, the mystery, secret truth revealed, which was written in 1895. What we want to look at here now is Bollinger's The Church Epistles, which was originally written in 1898. So if you look at your notes, about halfway down the page, in 1898, Bollinger wrote a series of articles on the Church Epistles. In 1902, these individual articles were compiled and published as a single volume titled The Church Epistles. So what happens is for the Things to Come journal, so 1898 from the Things to Come journal, he starts to publish in serial form the church epistles. Okay, now, later on, in 1902, I believe it is, if I, if I, is that what it says? Mm -hmm. Later on in 1902, all of these are going to be published as a whole book. Uh, Mike's making some, I believe, at the moment, so it should be here in a minute, okay? So, 1898, in a series of articles in the Things to Come periodical, which we've talked about the last two, the last two weeks, Bollinger starts to write his exposition on the church epistles. This is later going to be published in a whole book in a single volume in 1902. But the bulk of the writing is done much earlier than that, before it's all compiled and published into one book. In 1902, these individual articles were compiled and published as a single volume titled The Church Epistles. It is important to note that all the information contained in the 1900 book was originally published in 1898. Consequently, the Church Epistles should be viewed as a pre-1900 testimony as, the state, as to the state of Pauline truth. So, since the Church Epistles is lengthy, okay, we're talking about at least a th almost a 300-page book simply on... It's Bollinger's exposition of the different church epistles. It's, re it's really a commentary, in a sense, is what the church epistles is over the, the letters written to the Paul, uh, by Paul addressed to the churches. So since it's lengthy, we're only going to consider those sections that are most important to our overall purpose of assessing the state of Pauline truth before 1900. Okay? Now, in the introduction to this series, in the introduction to this book, Bollinger contends that there was an order in which Pauline truth, truth was lost and recovered. All right? um, moreover, the reason Christendom is so confused, according to Bollinger, is because the church has not apprehended Pauline truth as presented in the church epistles. So, if you would now, I'm uh, the bottom third for sure of page 15, at that first uh, lighter bullet point, quoting now from the book itself, the ninth, uh, from Bollinger's book on the church epistles. He says the following, he says, It was Pauline truth and the teaching from which all had turned away. It was this turning away from the truth as taught by the Holy Spirit through Paul, especially as contained in the epistles to uh, the, epistles to the Ephesians, that, uh, that led necessarily, number one, to the loss of the teaching concerning the mystery, the truth concerning the one body of Christ. The effect of this was that at once to put everything... The effect of this was at once to put everything wrong ecclesiastically and to make room for all the various and different bodies so-called with all the consequent divisions and schisms of the church. 
Instead of recognizing the one body which God had made, men set about making their own bodies and sex. With ecclesiastical confusion came the loss of truth of the Christian perfect standing in Christ as having died and risen with him. So in the introduction to this book, he begins discussing what he calls the loss and recovery of truth. And he says that the first, the first thing that's lost was an understanding of the mystery. Okay? And he says that the effect of this is basically, this is, I'm just going to sum this up, <coughs> denominationalism. All of the different schisms, bodies of men that arise have arisen from a lack of understanding the mystery according to what he says in the introduction. Number two. Next, after this, went the, truths, went the truth of the Lord's promise returned from heaven and of resurrection as, one great, as the one great and blessed hope of the church. Having lost the truth of what God had made, having lost the truth of what God had made Christ to be unto us, and the joy of our standing thus given, and looking for the blessed hope, preparation for death and judgment was the necessary result. So he says that the second thing that's lost, and I'm going to paraphrase him a little bit, when he's referring to the blessed hope, he's referring to what? He's referring to the rapture. Okay, so he says, mystery's lost first, then the blessed hope, the understanding of the rapture, the catching away of the saints, is the second thing that's lost. And then he says that leads, he's going to say in a second that that leads necessarily to the loss of the third thing at the top of page 16. The next thing to go was the truth that God had made the truth. Sorry. The next thing to go was the truth as to what God had made us to be in Christ, and justification by faith and by grace was lost. The way was now open for a full tide of air to come in. And it came in like a flood, with all the corruption and superstition which ended in centuries, which having a significant description, the Dark Ages. So he says the third thing to be lost is the issue of justification by grace through faith. So... Bollinger views truth, Pauline truth is being lost. First, the truth of mystery is lost. Second, the truth of the rapture of the blessed hope is lost. And third, justification by grace through faith is lost. Third, okay? Then he says, the Reformation itself, what was it but the beginning of the recovery of these great truths? The remarkable fact that this recovery of, of these truths has taken place in the inverse order in which they were lost. Justification by grace through faith through faith was the first great truth recovered at the Reformation. This was the truth over which the great battle was fought and won, though the victory was far from complete. For not until the 19th century had well begun to the Lord's return from heaven begin to, begin to become again the blessed hope of His church. In later years, the subject has become more and more precious to increasing numbers. The truth of the mystery, as it was the first to go, so it seems is the last to be recovered. It was with the hope of doing something to recover this truth that these papers have been written on the church epistles. May the Lord use them to bring back vital truths to their proper place, and, the, and their power be, may be felt in the hearts and seen in the lives of an increasing number of members of the body of Christ. The cause of all the confusion around is that thousands of those who profess to be Christians know little or nothing of these church epistles. There is no other profession which they could enter without being able to pass a satisfactory examination in the textbooks set forth for that purpose. There is no position in life that anyone could, could apply for without being asked how much one knew of its duties and responsibilities. But the Christian profession is treated in quite a different manner and is quite, in quite a different manner and is quite a different matter. Anyway, anyone may, anyone may undertake that all while be totally ignorant of the church epistles. So he's saying that anybody can be a minister, be a preacher, be a pastor, enter into the ministry, and have absolutely positively no clue about anything Paul says in his epistles. Okay? That, that's the point he's trying to make here. The four Gospels, the Sermon on the Mount, are taken as the essence of Christianity instead of the epistles 
specially addressed to the churches. Hence the great ignorance of Christians as to all that God has made Christ to be unto his people and all that he has made them to be in him, not knowing their standing in Christ and their completeness and perfection in him, they are necessarily led into error concerning their state and their walk. Many who know they are justified by grace, yet seek to be sanctified by works. Nothing but full knowledge is what, of what is revealed for our instruction in these church epistles will effectively deliver us from all the new doctrines and schools of thought which find an entrance into our minds. So he says, number one, this was the order that they're lost in. Then he says that they're recovered in the reverse order. So this would have been the first thing to be recovered. Okay. Then he says that this would have been the second thing to be recovered. And the third thing to be recovered would have been the mystery. And he's saying this in the introduction. And he's saying that the entire church of Christendom is ignorant because they haven't understood the teachings uh, that are contained in these church epistles. And he calls them the teachings of the Holy Spirit to the churches through the Apostle Paul. Okay? So all of this, this entire uh, swath of information here is all just from the introduction of the book. Any questions about any of that? Comments? Well, that just makes sense. It has to go in the reverse order. I mean, people don't understand justified by grace and faith. They're certainly not going to be able to teach them about the mystery. Yeah. <laughs> it was a uh, Grand Rapids. You know, talking to people, and it's a sad state of affairs out there, I'm telling you. How many, how many people did you talk to? What would you uh, say? Probably about 15. Yeah. And uh, I got, it wasn't until I got to the 10th one that I got the right answer about how you get to heaven. Really? Yeah. So if they don't, if they don't understand this... <clears throat> right, I mean, I'm sorry for that. I mean, if you got an unsaved person, you don't start with them here, you start with them here. You start with them at the cross here, right? Yeah. So in the first chapter titled The Seven Church Epistles, their, The Importance of Their Order, Bollinger contends that the teachings of Christ in the Gospels have been exalted over the teachings of Christ through the pen of Paul as recorded in the church epistles. Now, is it not a fact that most people put a preeminence over Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over any other part of the Bible? And the reason they do that is because those are the words of Jesus that are in red, what have you, and therefore they are given a, a, a higher state of authority. Bollinger says, I'm going to read that to you again. He said, Bollinger contends that the teachings of Christ in the Gospels have been exalted over the teachings of Christ through the pen of Paul as recorded in the church epistles. Herein lies the reason that Christendom is in such confusion. They have failed to recognize Pauline authority. It is, it is a serious, this is quoting Bollinger now, it is a serious blow to inspiration when the importance of one part of Scripture is exalted above another. To do this is to reduce the Bible to the position of any other book, and practically to deny the whole is made up of the words which the Holy Ghost teaches. This is done in the present day when according to the new uh, Roskillian school, the teaching of Jesus is exalted above the teaching of the Holy Spirit by Paul, as though there were a rivalry between the two. The words of Christ and the words of Paul are equal in weight and importance, inasmuch as both are recorded and given to us by the same Holy Spirit, and are therefore equal in authority. That authority is divine, and no difference can be made between them without jeopardizing the very essence of inspiration. That there is a difference is clear, but this difference arises from failing to rightly but the difference arises from failing to rightly divide the word of truth as to the various dispensations of which it treats. So, is it wrong, according to Bullinger, to view the Gospels as superior to Paul? Yes. Is it, would it also be wrong to view the uh, epistles of Paul as, uh, take, as, as um, somehow being... We understand they're more important dispensationally, but are they, all, are they all still Scripture? Are they all still given by inspiration of God? Absolutely, okay. He says that there is a difference, but this difference arises from failing to rightly divide the word of truth as to the various dispensations of which it treats. 
What he said on earth is necessarily of the highest importance to us dispensationally is showing how, through his rejection by his people Israel, the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. But that teaching was given to special persons under special circumstances, and it must be interpreted and applied accordingly. It was not designed as a compendium of, instru of instruction for the church of God. For the church was not then being formed. And as a matter of fact, the churches to whom the epistles were addressed did not at that time possess the four gospels as we have them. Seven churches were addressed as such by the Holy Spirit, seven being the number of spiritual perfection. The seven epistles of the Holy Spirit by Paul had already been had already been written and read and neglected and practically forsaken when Christ sent his own seven to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Some would tell us to go back to the first three centuries to find primitive Christianity in its purity. But these scriptures show us that we cannot even go back to the first century. The only successors. The only successors the apostles knew were linked to grievous wolves. The seven churches to which the Holy Spirit addressed in his epistles by Paul are Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians. Now, a couple things. First of all, he's pretty clear about what the problem is. Okay, He's pretty clear about the fact that you cannot put one part over the other part, that all parts need to be rightly divided, that you need to understand the things that differ to who they're, who they're written to, and so on and so forth. He also understands here that there are seven epistles that are addressed to the churches. And does he make any distinction here between the epistles that are written during the book of Acts and the epistles that are written at the end of the book of Acts? No. No. All right? In 1898, Bollinger is very clear that the truth of the mystery was revealed to Paul during the Acts period. This can be clearly discerned by considering his comments on Romans 16, 25 to 26. Why don't you go look there quick. Go to Romans 16. Go to Romans 16. Now, I drew this little thing up here a couple weeks ago. I'll just start it with Acts 9 when Paul gets saved. We'll go through Acts 28. So during the Acts period, Paul writes Galatians, Thessalonians, he writes Corinthians, and he writes Romans during, during this Acts period. Okay. Now the verse we're going to read is in Romans 16, we want verse 25 and 26. All right. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that has the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, <coughs> which is kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, comma, and by the scriptures of the prophets. Now, so this is what he said about that verse in 1898, about those verses. He quote, quoting him, the importance of thus rightly dividing is seen in the final member, chapter 16, verses 25 through 27 of the epistle, as in every other. Here we have the mystery in contrast to God's gospel. Hold your hand there and go to Romans 1. We'll flip back to Romans 1. Bollinger is big on, if you've ever studied him, he's big on this symmetry, these outlines that he sees within the... Uh, the books. Look at Romans chapter 1, look at verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets, where? So he starts the book by talking about the, the, the generic gospel of God that's been spoken about since when? By the scriptures of the prophets, right? Then he closes the book by talking about the revelation of the Mystery, which was kept secret, what? Since the world, Since the world began. Okay? So back, back to his, his statement here. There are those who willingly close their eyes and perversely refuse to see the difference between these two. But the Word of God is clear for all who have eyes, who have the eyes of their understanding open. Ephesians 1.18 declares the necessity of this. 
for the, for the understanding of the mystery, which is the great subject of Ephesians, as we shall see. It surely must be clear to the simplest, honest mind that God's gospel, which is expressly stated to have been promised before in his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, cannot possibly be the same as the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is ma made manifest by prophetic writings. If they be the same, then language is useless for the purpose of revelation. If this be doctrine and instruction, what is the special instruction conveyed by by, say, by stating that promise before <coughs> means kept secret from times eternal until now. What answer could be given to the infidel who believing what is taught by some Christians as to this mistakenly identify expo exposes such a discrepancy as is here created? No, we abide by the teaching here that the mystery was a revelation made to Paul after this divine call, after this divine calling to be an apostle. So in like manner there was good news concerning the body of Christ, which his people now are members on earth, and he is a great and glorious head in heaven. This is good news. And, and it is part of the gospel, being specially committed to Paul. He sometimes speaks of it as my gospel, as being distinguished from that committed to the twelve. He speaks of it as my gospel here, Romans chapter 16, verse 25. And whether this refers to the mystery and the, and the preaching, etc., the conclusion is the same. The mystery always hitherto hidden cannot be the same as that which was promised before. What the mystery or secret is, is not the purpose of the epistle of the Romans to teach. The subjective doctrinal foundation for it is laid... And it is merely mentioned at the close in order to complete the beautiful structure of the epistle and to prepare the way for it being taken up in the Ephesians. Where it fully dealt with as the next great lesson, where it is fully dealt with as the next great lesson to be to be taught in Romans, uh, must first be exper exper uh, experimentally received and learned before we before we can pass to the more advanced lesson of Ephesians. Having learned what it is to have died with Christ and to have risen with Christ, we are in Ephesians, further taught what it is to be, what it is to be now already seated in the heavenlies in Christ. But the bottom line is he write this during the Acts period. Mm -hmm. So if he writes it during the Acts period, does Paul know what the revelation of the mystery is during the Acts period? Of course. Of course. He just doesn't fully explain it till when? Ephesians. So Bollinger says that the book of Romans is addressed to the, to the church of this dispensation and he says and, and explains at the end that, it, that he understands what that was to some degree when he wrote it and, and so on. Therefore to me it's very clear that this book is not an Acts 28 book which would make a distinction between the epistles that are written during the Acts period and the epistles that are written after the book of Acts. He views, at this time, 1898, he views all of these as applying to who? The body of Christ. Okay? <clears throat> Bottom of page 18. In his comments on the first epistle to the Corinthians, Bollinger is explicitly clear that the revelation of the mystery is the truth about the one body of Christ. Paul could not teach the Corinthians this because they were not spiritually ready to hear, but were divided into man-made groups. The main point is this. Paul knew the mystery when he wrote the Corinthians during the Acts period, but could not teach it to the Corinthians because of their immature spiritual state. Quoting Bollinger, We have seen how in Romans 16, 25, and 26, the mystery is referred to and stated as a fact. The time was come for it to be made known. The saints might be established as the church of God apart from the earthly hope of Israel as a nation. Now that as a nation Israel was cut off. The saints, now, now look at it. He says they're already cut off during when? During this next period. Okay? Anyway. The saints were to know a higher heavenly calling. But in 1 Corinthians 2, <coughs> the reasons are given why when the apostle was at Corinth, he could not preach the mystery to the saints. 
there, instead of recognizing that they were one body in Christ and members one of another, they were forming separate bodies on their own and class and uh, classing themselves under different teachers. And everyone said, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos and I am of Cephas. Instead of reckoning, reckoning themselves <coughs> as having died with Christ to sin, since he had died for their sins, they were, they were living in sin. This is why he could not preach the mystery to them. Owning to their division and their being taken up by their own bodies, they were not in a fit condition spiritually to receive the revelation of the mystery, which is the one body of Christ, of which he was the glorious head in heaven, and his people members of it on earth. This is a spiritual body. This is a spiritual union and a spiritual truth. It can be declared only to spiritual persons. The mystery involves the full truth of this new and heavenly standing. It involves truth far beyond substitution and death. It involves union with Christ and all the value of His death, burial, and resurrection. It embraces the truths connected with His ascension and coming again. It involves not only our present standing in Christ, but the hope of our union with Christ in glory when we shall come to be glorified in His saints. So, Bollinger states that Paul knew the mystery when he was in Corinth planting the church in that city. Something of the, of the mystery which, had, uh, which, which he had could not announce to them when he had first visited them and planted the church of Christ among them. It is clear from Bollinger's own pen that early in his ministry he did not distinguish between the Acts and post-Acts epistles of Paul, nor did, he state, nor did he start the church in Acts 28. Any questions or comments about any of that? Can you still get that book? The church of Oh yeah. I've got it. I've got it at home. You can buy it. If you look up on the Amazon or um, on the internet, you should be able to find it fairly easily. It'll be probably be a reprint, probably won't be an original, but Bollinger's discussion of the, of the epistle to the Galatians, another Acts period epistle, includes a section on baptism. The significance of this section should not be underestimated. The fact that it was originally penned in 1898 makes it quite possibly the earliest known to this author at this time explanation of a no water position on baptism. As to, this is what he said, quoting Bollinger, as to baptism, there, there is the same remarkable reference to as many as were baptized. And while in Romans we are taught the dogmatic truth as to our death with Christ expressed in the likeness of his death, the old man being put off, being crucified with Christ, here in Galatians 3, 27. The baptism with the Spirit referred to whereby Christ, the new man, is put on. That those who are risen with Christ in the likeness of His resurrection, wherein they are to exist, stand concerned, stand, sorry, covered with Him and, and His righteousness as with a garment, no longer reckoned as being in the first Adam, but standing before God on a new ground, resurrection ground, in Christ, having thus put on Christ, now notice, not by baptism in what? Water. Water, but by burial and resurrection with Christ. When the exhortation is given to put on Christ, it can mean only that we are to reckon ourselves as having died and risen with Christ. How else can it be? Truth to be practical must be practicable. In what way can we mortify the flesh? Not by controlling it. Controlling is not killing. And the word rendered mortify means to put to death. By what act, can, by what act then can we put the flesh to death except by reckoning ourselves as having died according to Romans 6.11? And by knowing that our old man was crucified with him, this is the knowledge which is given in Romans, and the practical outcome of it is seen in Galatians 2.20. So he says, how, how do you get into Christ? 
Even if Christ was standing here, how do I get into Christ? Spiritual baptism, right, takes me out of Adam and puts me where? In the Christ. Okay? And Bollinger says that the only way you can have that is not with baptism of what? Water. So if you look at the summary now, page 20. <coughs> Analysis of the church epistles reveals the following aspects of mid acts Pauline dispensationalism. Once again, this evaluation is critical because it does because it does not turn up any hint of the Acts 28 position that dominated Bollinger's later writings. Number one, all the epistles of Paul addressed to the churches, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians, are for the church of this dispensation. How many agree with that? I do. Number two, Paul's words contained in the epistles are equal to those of Christ recorded in the four Gospels. The failure to acknowledge and apply this truth has led to the teachings, the teaching of Jesus being exalted over the teachings of the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul. Romans 6, third, Romans 16.25 lays the doctrinal foundation for Ephesians where the truth of the mystery is fully developed. Therefore, Paul knew the mystery when he wrote Romans in Acts 20. Fourth, furthermore, Paul knew the mystery when he went to Corinth. Look up, if you want to, look up 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, where we said, we speak the wisdom of God and what? The mystery, even hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world, and so on and so forth. So fourth, Paul knew <clears throat> the mystery when he went to Corinth, but did not widely preach it because of the spiritual state of the Corinthians. And fifth, in his comments on Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Bollinger is explicitly clear that the baptism with the Spirit is, refer is referred to, that doesn't seem why right, I'll have to check that, is referred to whereby Christ, the new man, is put on, not by baptism in water, but by burial and resurrection with Christ. Bollinger is clearly teaching a no-water position with regard to the issue of baptism and identification with Christ. Now, admittedly, the book goes on to comment on the rest of the church epistles. But what I've done is I've isolated three dispensationally significant areas within these Acts period epistles that indicate that he is not making any distinction between these epistles, and he views all of them as applying to the church, the body of Christ. Okay? Now, does anybody have any questions about any of that? I can tell you that we're probably actually going to be done early today, I think. Does anybody have any questions about any of that? Now, before we go for the summer, as it were, with this class, while I get myself together for read up and so on over the summer. I thought it was important that we not leave before I gave you a summary of the state, what I'm calling it the state of Pauline truth by the year 1900. Okay, so if you would look at page 20. So, after surveying the works of Darby, Trotter, Holden, McIntosh, and Bollinger, written before 1900, we have clearly demonstrated the following aspects of Pauline truth were known and in print before the turn of the century. Okay? So all of this stuff was known before the year 1900. Not only was it known, but it was in print. I want to make the point one more time. Most of the time, this stuff is being preached before it's in print. Okay? Oh, it is almost always the case that things are being preached and taught and refined through the preaching and teaching ministries before they're set to paper. Just seems to be the, the way it goes. So by the year 1900, by looking at these authors that we've surveyed since the time around Christmas time, uh, Darby, Trotter, Holden, McIntosh, and Bullinger, um, the following aspects of of Pauline mid acts dispensationalism can be discerned, okay? Number one, a clear distinction between prophecy and mystery. All these men saw that. Darby saw it, Trotter saw it, Holden saw it, McIntosh saw it, and so did, so did Bollinger. Number two, the church was a unique Pauline revelation unknown prior to the time of Paul. They knew that. 
Number three, despite an official Act II stance on the part of Darby and Trotter, the opening chapters of Acts are viewed as being Jewish in character and content. Act 7 is viewed by these men as the final tale of Judaism. Meanwhile, Holden, McIntosh, and Bullinger are all clear that Acts 2 is not the beginning of the body of Christ. Fourth, the church was in the mind of God before the world began. It was thus first in the plan and program of God, but last in the order of revelation. Okay? They knew this. Fifth, the mystery pertains to the formation of the body of Christ. The truth that Jews and Gentiles would be reconciled to God in one body by the cross was never revealed prior to the ministry and writings of the Apostle Paul. Now this list is getting quite long here, okay? I mean, they knew all this stuff, and it, you, could have, you could learn all of these things by reading all the stuff that we've covered in this class. Before O'Hare, before Stamp, before Baker, before any of the founders of the so-called grace movement. Page, top page 21. The church's blessings are spiritual in nature and heavenly in position, whereas Israel's blessings were physical in nature and earthly in position. They understood that. The phrase, time pass and but now, the phrases time pass but now were in usage to explain dispensational distinctives. You saw that specifically in Trotter where he does that. Next, principalities and powers in heavenly places are taught the manifold wisdom of God by the church, the body of Christ. We see them teaching that. The dispensation of the fullness of times is a future dispensation in which all things in heaven and on earth will be centered in the person of Jesus Christ. They understood that the, a lot of these issues. Now, I, about that, I will tell you that Darby did not understand that the same way that some of the later guys did. The bottom line is that the majority of those men were, were, were teaching stuff like this. Uh, next, the source of all the confusion. In it, the source of all the confusion in Israel stems from the failure to rightly divide the word of truth as well as from the general ignorance of the mystery. And I think that should say the source of all the confusion in the church, not Israel. I have to change that. Next, Paul is the divinely appointed instructor for the dispensation of grace, just as Moses was during the dispensation of the law. Now look, all this is known. All this is known and in print by the year 1900. That's the point here. All right? Next, the church in the wilderness, Acts 735, is different from the church, the body of Christ. The mystery includes the following three points. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, that they should be one body, and that they should be partakers or, or co-partners of God's promise in the Messiah. Next, the establishment of the kingdom is the subject of prophecy. Therefore, the Old Testament, four Gospels, as well as early Acts, contain a consistent testimony to Israel. The four Gospels and Acts record the history of Israel's rejection of her king and kingdom. Next, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the twelve apostles presented a consistent ministry to Israel during the Gospels and early Acts through the preaching of the Gospel of the Kingdom. Consequently, the parables, i.e. the mysteries of the Kingdom in Matthew, have nothing to do with the church, the body of Christ. Next, Satan's actions in bringing about the death of Christ wrought out God's secret purpose concerning the church the body of Christ. The body of Christ will dispossess Satan and his angels from their current positions in the heavenlies and inherit their, inherit their vacated positions of rank and authority. Through the revelation of the mystery, Satan's entire plan of evil is thwarted. Holden taught that forcefully, as we saw a few weeks back. Next, Christendom has degenerated into a form of bastard Judaism. Because they have failed to rightly divide the word of truth. That's what Holden said about it. Israel's program has been mixed with the body's program, which has caused the church to fall short of true understanding. Next, the difference between the believer's standing and state was understood.
Pentecost was not the beginning of the body of Christ. The church is not the bride of Christ, but part of the bridegroom. Now, obviously, that is being taught by Bollinger. That was not taught by Darby and Trotter and some of the others. But that is a, that is a point of refinement that we see as we went through the chronology here of the different writers. Next, all the, prison of, oh, sorry, all the Pauline epistles, even those written during the Acts period, are for this dispensation. There was a difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God committed to Paul. Failure to understand Paul's gospel articulated in the first eight chapters of Romans were the source of the church's confusion. The blessed hope of the church was the rapture when the Lord returns to meet the saints in the air. This event was clearly understood to be different and distinct from the Lord's bodily second coming recorded in Revelation 19. And second to last, the body of Christ is formed by baptism of the Holy Spirit into Christ. This is not accomplished through, uh, through the baptism with water. And last, those standing for Pauline authority can always expect to be in the minority when compared with the professing church. Now, I don't know what, you, I don't know what your thoughts are about this list, but this is quite a list of stuff, of mid-Acts beliefs, Pauline dispensational beliefs, that are known and in print by the turn of the last century. By the turn of the, as the time went from the 1800s to the 1900s, somebody could have read books written by authors during that time period that would have explained all of these doctrines to them. So they could have had, they were available, they were known, they were in print, uh, and in some cases, significantly so. So if you look at the last point before we see if there's any questions or comments, there can be little doubt that the real history of the resurgence in Pauline truth is much more edifying, enlightening, and fascinating than the institutional histories that have for too long dominated these historical dis discussions within the so-called grace movement. Folks, anytime you have a... The, the histories of this stuff that have been written thus far have, as I said to you before, they've only traced it back to the period of the founders of the organizations. Okay? So if you were to read those books, if you were to read those things, they would make it seem like a Pauline dispensational understanding of the Scripture fell out of the clear blue sky one day with J.C. O'Hare. Now you need not misunderstand me because somebody's going to watch this and say I'm criticizing Mr. O'Hare. I'm not. Okay? I think, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about him and what he did when we come back from, from uh, um, summer break here. But I'm not saying that what those men did wasn't significant. What I'm saying is that it's an inconsistent history and an incomplete history to not understand that there was a major resurgence in this truth that had already occurred in some cases, up to 60 to 70 years before those men had their ministries. And so by the time you get to the year 1900, all of these things are known. So let me just read the last statement here. So by the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, there were already strong voices contending for the Word of God rightly divided and the revelation of the mystery committed to the Apostle Paul. All right. Anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts, remarks? Ernie? Um, Sir Robert Anderson. Is he a contemporary of Bollinger? Yeah. Sir Robert Anderson was one of the uh, six men that signed the charter creating the Things to Come journal. I don't think you were here uh, when I talked, went over it, but in the very first edition, there's an announcement that the Coming Prince book was already in its like fourth printing. And that was in 1894. Okay, so Sir Robert Anderson and Bollinger are coming of you know coming to uh, um, the contemporaries with each other at the same time. There's uh, there's there's one illustration of this in uh, I don't remember which volume it is, but in one of the things to come, there's like a little notation uh, that Sir Robert Anderson wrote, and it said something like. Last week, Bully and I. So he's re, he's on such a first he's on such a friendly basis with him that he's referring to him as 
you know, bully. He's not calling him Dr. Bullinger or, you know, anything like that. That's just the kind of relationship they had, no doubt. Any other questions? Yeah. I just have um, a question, I guess. The second bullet point, the church is not the bride of Christ, which I knew. What page? Um, it's the very last, very last page, the second bullet point. Um, but we're part of the bridegroom. I guess I never heard that before. Were you here two? You weren't here two no. weeks ago, were you? Uh, you no. need to look at page in these notes. Bollinger's discussion of this point. Okay. Um, is on. Hang on. Hang on. Page twelve. Yep. Now, just real quick, what he says is, as members of the church of the body of Christ, we're in who? In we're in Christ. We are part of the bridegroom himself. We are not the bride of the groom. That's okay. I mean, sit, you want to you want to read that yourself to get his full explanation of that, and, and look at the verses also that he that has, he uses. Has that been posted yet? On, um, yes. On, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. part of this lesson. But but that's a, but that's a key that's a key point because here you have right at the end of the right at the end of the 19th century, as we're getting ready to enter into the 20th century, you have this 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 cert, this piece that's figured out regarding the body regarding the bride of Christ issue that the that the writers before Bollinger didn't didn't get in my opinion did not get correct. So again, you see refinement starting with the time of Darby going all the way through. There's a there's a ref, ref, refining process going on in these doctrines as more clarity is coming forth as time moves on. And you see that particularly at the close of the century, when right before the close of the century, Bollinger makes this point about the true identity of the uh, bride of Christ. All right. Anybody else have any other questions, comments, things? I don't. I don't know. And I'm just going to say this is my sort of conclusion for the summer. I don't know if you realize what we've done in here. Okay. Because what what we've done in here, in my opinion, as far as everything I know up to this point, is that we have created and assembled in one spot a host of, histor of his history and documentation about the real story about the recovery of Pauline truth that heretofore has not been able to be found in one spot. Okay? So, I mean, what we've done here is very significant in that regard, and I hope you don't... I hope you uh, understand that, that you guys that have been faithfully coming and attending have, have sat in on something that has never been, to my mind before, laid out the way that we've laid it out here, okay? And summarized and encapsulated the way that we've, the way that we've done that. And we've tried to do that using a, a very clear historical progression and understanding of a, of a process of a, refining, of a refinement that was going on. Um, so we are going to be done with church history class for the summer after this lesson. All right. Now, next Sunday though, um, I've there are going to be some younger men in this assembly that are going to be teaching, and that I've asked to start working on developing some teaching skills as teachers in the assembly. And the first one of those is going to be next Sunday. It's going to be at 9 o'clock. I'm going to be here. I'm working on mentoring these guys. Uh, and, and it's going to be Josh. Josh Dakin is going to be uh, in here. And so we will have a study. It will not be part of the church history class. But if you are in the habit and are interested in coming in and supporting a younger guy as he gets started, you know, we encourage you to do that. I'm sure he would rather teach to five, ten of five to ten of you than one person. So, just throw that out there for you. And the yeah. subject matter will be the first two to get him started. I told him he could pick what he wanted. Then after that, he's going to be teaching through Galatians five. I told him I wanted him to teach through Galatians five. 
So that's what's on the agenda for the summer. Okay. Yeah. I'm just thinking going back through uh, the 1900s, before the 1900s, all this, you know, was um, being preached and then printed. And yet, it got to so few people. Was this the act of, um, oh, yeah. of, of our adversaries trying to keep that truth away oh. from, the, from the churches? Or so, people just having good years and not wanting to hear it? Well, I mean, I think it's probably both. But I think, too, that, I mean, that particularly when you think about the things to come journal, the mail that they they had an internet they truly had an international mailing list. Yeah. So that stuff was being sent all around the world through that through that group. Because the thing I we haven't talked to you much yet about Bollinger personally, but Bollinger was president also of the Trinitarian Bible Society. Mm -hmm. So he had a lot of contacts that he was able then to use to disseminate this other information from as well. So I don't know. There are a lot of people that are that are he, that are being exposed to dispensational Bible study through the Things to Come journal. Now I have no way of knowing how many or whatever, but it was there was a lot of people that were being at least exposed to this type of thinking. Yeah. Norm. Has there been any <clears throat> has there been any kind of parallel uh, organizations to the the so-called grace movement through anywhere else in the world that can be. Uh, Track back to, to Dr. Bullinger uh, that's actually held its ground the whole time that they, you know, since Again, I, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I know that, and we'll talk about this in more detail uh, after we take a summer break, but when, when the idea comes up to make the companion Bible, the guy that financed the companion Bible was a wealthy businessman from New Zealand. So this guy lives in New Zealand down there by Australia, and he's sending Bollinger money in England to, to produce the companion Bible. So it'd be fascinating to take a trip to New Zealand and figure out, is there some type of a, you know, grace group that is in and, and active in New Zealand that would have been the result from any of this work that was going on there? I don't know, but it'd be, it, you know, th there's... Every time I every time I almost like flip over one page and figure something out, I have like ten more questions, <laughs> and so it's it's the ten other questions that are what sort of frustrates me and bothers me. But I I am happy with I think how much stuff we have been able to lay out here. Yeah. Um, I was talking to someone about Bollinger, and they were saying that they thought Welsh had um, <coughs> finished. The one book that talks about Bollinger being on an Acts 28 position, and they said, "Who knows where Bollinger took off and Welsh took over in that idea?" So, what, what do you think? What do you say about that? Well, I'm going to talk about that in more, oh. more specifically okay. about um, when we get there. But um, it, it, it's clear when you look at the Companion Bible, the last section to be published without Bollinger, that a different person wrote it <coughs> because it's not. It does not have the same. It's not as insightful, I suppose, as some of the other things that, that are written in the Companion Bible. Um, and in fact, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of misinformation out there even about that issue. A lot of people, a lot of grace people think that Welsh finished editing the Companion Bible. That's not true. The, guy, the wealthy guy, the benefactor in New Zealand, when Bollinger died, he wanted it to be Welsh. This guy in New Zealand. But the family, the surviving family of Bollinger said no. We don't want Welsh, we want Sir Robert Anderson. So Sir Robert Anderson was actually the, the, the final editor for the sections of the Companion Bible that Bollinger didn't finish, which caused the wealthy guy in New Zealand to pull his support. He was mad about it. Okay? Um, but we'll talk more about that stuff when we, when we get there. And, and, you know, you say, well, then that's... <coughs> as soon as I found that out, then that raised questions in my mind immediately. Well, what's the dispositional position of Sir Robert Anderson then? Okay, and I think you're going to be, I think I'm going to show you that Sir Robert Anderson probably was an X28 guy at the end of his life. Okay, so anyway, we'll, we'll get to all that stuff later on. Any other questions? Just thank you for your time and your oh, oh, you're you're welcome. welcome. I'll be glad when it's done. <laughs> but, uh, if, I'll, I'll be
be glad when it's done, but I'll be strangely disappointed. It'll be weird. I don't think it'll ever be totally done. Because I'm going to continue to, you know, for the sake of the class, there eventually has to be a point where it's done. Just because that's just so in 2015 we're starting a new one. I wouldn't say that. I say what would be coming down the line are addendum lessons, individual addendum lessons as more information is um, made known. But anyway, thanks for your attention. You know, I get 